Isaiah 51 is what I have up on the screen. We're going to start there tonight. Appreciate everybody uh, being here. Um, we bought more food. Yeah. And it's hard to come by. So I suggested to Michael that we call up the Catholic Church and offer to buy all the food that they're hoarding, not giving out. That way it'll get given out. Well, come to find out. Can I tell this? Okay. Um, that office that we used to have in Turkana, that they run us out of, Catholic Church put pressure or paid a bribe or whatever to the, um, to the lease owner of the property uh, to force us out. So he wrote us up the thing saying, you got to get out by such and such date. So we did. And the Catholic Church was going to use that to store food so they could give it out apparently at some point in the way distant future who knows what well it turns out they don't really need the office space so they reneged on their offer to the catholic church so the landlord called us and said you want to come back and we went no no, you think we're stupid? No. Um, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. With everything that happened last year. And all the attacks. All the turmoil. All the uh, family things that happened. It was a rough year. Down deep in my heart, I kept telling myself, Mike, those are birth pangs. Anything God's going to do that's great and fabulous and awesome and magnificent and wonderful, it's like a baby being born. There's always going to be birth pangs as a result of it. And all the torment you're in, as soon, those and ladies, I know nothing about this. But from what I hear, and I saw it in Lisa, this soon as a child is born, the memory of the pain goes away. Because you're holding that baby. And um, when I look at how God has moved in us this year and how God is, you know, then to top it all off, Michael gets in a near fatal car accident could have very easily took his life. And there is no doubt in my mind, devils were behind that. Um, and you keep praying for him. His back's messed up as a result of it. And we really gave serious consideration as to shutting it all down. I'm glad we didn't. Uh, because the way the Lord's blessing that right now, I, I'm just beside myself. I am just beside myself. So we uh, were able to find more food. We're able to get some more corn, more beans, more salt. And we're also throwing in soap for the people, for their hygiene. And... Um, so praise the Lord for that. That's and we're going to we're going to start giving out. We're going to keep giving out more food. Amen. And uh, we'll do that for as long as God says do it. Amen. So I am I'm just tickled to death over that. I really am. I'm 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 proud. Uh, this church and proud to be part of it. And you folks here and you folks online. I, I'm just proud to be part of God's people. I really am. Aren't you glad you're saved? Amen? Amen. Amen. So what does that mean, being saved? We talked about that last Wednesday night. Saved from what? Of course, you're saved from God's wrath. But I, I don't know if I really made this clear last week. But I used to say this a lot, uh, especially in my younger days. I, I knew then that when God saved me, 
He not only saved me from the things that I had already done, but he in fact saved me from a future that would have been full of probably worse things. He saved me from that. Now I'm not, in, I would never stand up behind any pulpit or in front of any group of people and say, I'm pretty good serving God. I'm pretty good at this. I would never say that in a million years. Um, but I definitely, I know me, I know me pretty well. And I know that the things that God has pulled me out of and saved me from, um, he saved me from quite a bit. And I'm very, very, very thankful for that. So when God saves you, he saves you not only from the wrath to come, but he saves you from the self-inflicted pain and injury that your own sin brings to your life. Um, who's, who's known somebody that died at a, a really, I guess, a relatively young age because of sin? Raise your hand. My uncle. I have an uncle, my mother's side, that he he was a drunk all the years I'd known him. Um, and I mean just a bad drunk and a woman chaser. And he would marry a girl just to be able to get with her. And at one time he was married to more than one woman at the same time. And... Um, you know, we recently, I met a cousin that I never knew I had because of that. But he died in his 30s of cirrhosis of the liver. And usually that takes a long time to develop. Didn't take him long at all. The way he drank, it did not take him long at all. And he shriveled up almost to nothing and died at a very, very young age. And sad to say, he is in hell. That's been since the late 70s, and he's been there ever since. So I'm glad God saved you. Amen. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll have our prayer time tonight. Uh, pray for Sweetie Pie. She overdid it yesterday, doing the packets. And um, so we went to bed last night, and she said, don't wake me up tomorrow. Honey, I shouldn't have woke you up this morning. So pray for her and that God will give her rest and give her recovery. Uh, pray for me. Friday, I'm going to have a little bit of uh, procedure done on Friday again. And um, then I'm going to, hopefully, I'm going to be able to preach. Rose assures me I'll be able to preach Sunday, right? You don't know how I handle pain. I'm not a woman that handles it well. I don't. So anyway, we'll just, we'll leave it in the Lord's hands, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it is a joy to be in your house tonight. I was glad when they said to us, let us go to the house of the Lord. Father, I've enjoyed the day uh, laboring for you. I've enjoyed the work, God, that you've given into my hands. Uh, I've enjoyed sharing the word already today. And I pray, Lord, that once uh, today's video is released, Father, that you would bless it. Father, I know, Lord, that some of the things I say is bound to buck against uh, what some people think. Uh, but, Father, if I can just get people, if I can provoke them by what I say, to go to the scriptures to find out whether what I said is true or not true. Uh, then it accomplishes a good thing. There's nothing wrong with us having our beliefs challenged. Your word tells us, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Some doctrines that we learn, Father, we find out later. That they're, they, they're, they're not right. They're not, they actually violate scripture. And so, Father, we pray, God, that you would open our eyes in everything. And especially this issue of salvation. Lord, it does, in my opinion, it matters. What we say 
and what we teach about people's salvation. Because I've seen in people's lives this notion that because they prayed a prayer of repentance back when they were seven years old, six years old, somewhere, they were told that that did that hook them in for the rest of their life. So no matter how, what kind of vile, wicked life they lived after that, they're still going to heaven. And Father, I think there are warnings against that in your word. And I pray, dear God, that you would open up our eyes to it, help us to see it. Help us to see, God, that there is an end to our faith. And Father, help us to remain faithful as stewards in, in the house of the Lord. Help us to remain faithful to your word and to the word of salvation. And Father, carry us then through the, on that day from this life to the next. It's in you we trust. We learned long time ago, Lord, not to trust ourselves. So, Father, help us to put confidence in your word alone. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Isaiah 58, let me, let me establish this before we move into the next segment. Uh, and, and we learned a little bit about this when we were studying the doctrine of God. The doctrine of God, one of the things that I don't remember if we touched on it, I don't remember if I actually taught this particular part of it, uh, but it would be the idea that God is immutable, which means that God doesn't change from one day to the next. He doesn't say, well, salvation is this way today, and then 24 hours later or a year later or a thousand years later, he comes up with some alternate plan then it says, that's how, well, I've changed my mind. This is how it's going to be. This is how people are saved. We've got new, law, new laws now, and this is how it's going to be done. My belief is, and I can see it plainly in the scripture, that the way God saved me, same way he saved David, same way he saved Adam, same way he saved Moses, same way he saved Joshua and Caleb, God Give salvation on the basis of his grace alone through our faith. There is God's part, his grace, and his, uh, what 1 John 5, 1, 9 says, he is faithful and just. God's faithfulness and God's judicial responsibility to never violate his word. If God says it, then he himself abides by the same law that he pronounces. God's not above even his own word. In fact, the Bible says, Thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. And so if God issues a way, this is how it's going to be. And so God's not above that. And, and God's, uh, his faithfulness, his judicial responsibility says that, that he would then cleanse us from all unrighteousness and wash away our sins. And it's been that way ever since God took animal skins and clothed Adam and Eve. He covered up their sins. He adorned them with a, with a, with an innocent sacrifice and adorned them and covered their transgressions. And he did that on the basis of his grace alone. So Isaiah 51 8 says, For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, the worm shall eat them like wool, but my righteousness, this is God talking, but my righteousness shall be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. So let's look at the two things here in this verse that God said. My righteousness shall be forever. In other words, if God said thou shalt not commit adultery and he said that, let's say 3,500 years ago. Did God change his mind and now it is okay for a person to commit adultery? Did God alter the word that it went forth out of his mouth? No. If God said it back then, it's still applicable. If God says, I hate adultery and I hate fornication, I hate lasciviousness and uncleanness. If he said it 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, he is the same God and he hates the exact same sins as he does now. And then he says this, and my salvation... From generation to generation. My grandfather 
on my mother's side. I never knew him. He died when my mother was five. Um, he was a Baptist preacher. Now, I don't know exactly what kind of preacher he was. I, there's no recordings of his preaching anywhere. Don't know where he preached, how long he preached, and so on. But he at one time was uh, a, a preacher. Well, I am convinced that the same way that God saved my grandfather and my grandmother, it's the exact same way he saved their grandchildren who were saved. Saved them the same way. The way that God saves us is the way that God saved all of the people back in the Old Testament. Now, so let me ask you this question. There are those who say that's not possible because acceptance of the gospel for salvation means that you believe the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How can a person be saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ when it hasn't even happened yet before the time of Christ? How would you answer that? How would you respond to somebody like that? How would you scripturally deny that statement? And I've talked to people and met them and believe it or not, I've gotten into arguments with them over this issue. Was da is David going to be in heaven? Absolutely. But how could David have believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ when it happened, hasn't happened yet in David's lifetime? Or we could say that of Moses. We could say that of Adam. Right. Right. By faith... And, and we know that we have old, the, in the, contained in the Old Testament law, we have sufficient references to shadows, foreshadowings of the cross of Calvary and Christ's resurrection from the dead. We have foreshadowing that all throughout the Old Testament. So while it may have been a mystery to them, they still believe. Remember, I, God never tells us that we have to completely understand everything in his word. He tells us to believe everything in his word. Then God will then give the understanding if he chooses, you know, to do that. So I say there's enough in the Old Testament that foreshadows the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ in order for people back then to be able to see and to believe in what God said. Uh, think about Hosea. I think it's Hosea chapter, I want to say Hosea chapter six, uh, where it talks about, uh, I better go read it. My mind's a blank tonight. I'll reference all these places and not even be able to quote them. Uh, Joel, Hosea, Joel. Yeah. Hosea chapter six. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He is smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day we will raise, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Well, there's, you have a, actually the time prophecy of Christ's resurrection given. It's the third day. So could they have believed in resurrection even all the way back in the days of Hosea? Absolutely. They could have believed in it. But the bottom line is, God said, my salvation is from generation to generation. And the same salvation that saved all of our forefathers, same salvation that saves us tonight. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The same God that created the heavens and the earth, the same God that planted the two trees in the midst of the garden, the tree of life, and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The same God that formed Lucifer, that piercing serpent. The same God that, and, and by creating Lucifer, thus introduced temptation into the world. The same God to did that, that did that is the same God that you see there in Malachi chapter 3. And the same God that we have now. I am the Lord. I change not. 
So when I say this in response to, and, and I, I recorded another Watchman broadcast today, it's part two of Matthew 24, and I actually learned some things doing this study, some things that I had never really seen before in the scripture, so I'm glad I'm doing it. It's edifying me already. Um, but it's this idea of, I'm going to say hyper-dispensationalism, that says that God has a different method of salvation at different times in ancient history, different times. There was the uh, Noetic Covenant. That's how God saved Noah back in his day. But it was different than how God saved Abraham. And it was different than how God saved Moses and how God saved David and how God will save the Jews in the last days, all of those salvations are different methods of salvation than God has chosen to save us. And I cannot believe that. Though we are an angel preach from heaven, bring, preach any other gospel than that we have preached. Let him be a curse, the Bible says. So I must believe that there can only be one gospel, one way of saving mankind. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He's not going to change. He's not going to change. Which you ought to be thankful for. He's not going to give you all these promises that you're saved and then one day say, you know what? I don't like you Gentiles. You guys make me mad too much. I'm going to walk away from all of you guys. Whatever I said, I'm backing out of it. I, I couldn't care less about you and I'm not saving you. Well, that would make him a liar. And I don't think any one of us believe that we serve God as a liar. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So he says, verse 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Think of what the internet has done. Doctrines that you would have never even imagined coming out now. And you do have people, I, this is, I'm doing a study on Matthew 24. Many shall come saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. You have got all kinds of people now coming out of the woodwork proclaiming to be Jesus Christ or something like Jesus Christ or even better than Jesus Christ. I mentioned here a while back, I did a study on David Koresh and what was his doctrine? What was his teachings? What was it that had those people, he did not lock them in that compound and would not let them out. They were there of their own free will, but he had convinced them that he was God's chosen one, that he was uh, Cyrus, he was Koresh. That's what, where it's where, what was his real name? David Howell? That was his real name, it was his birth name. And he changes it to, it wasn't David Howell, something Howell, Vernon Howell. And he changes, legally changes his name to David Koresh to identify himself so that all of these all of these 12 and 13 year old girls that he's marrying. He's saying that they're joining the house of David. And the house of David believes that David is going to father the 24 elders that surround the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4. That's just perverted, amen? Amen. Well, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. And I counseled somebody on this the other day. If you find that you're reading too much of the internet, make it a goal that for every hour you read the internet, read the Bible an hour. Equal time. Because it'll take that long to wash out the garbage that you read in the internet. For it is a good thing, uh, be not carried away with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, 
which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. He doesn't change his alt word. He doesn't alter the word that goes forth out of his mouth. And he doesn't alter the gospel. It's been the same throughout all generations. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 4. He says, there is one body, not two, not seven, not 15. There's one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. And if you count these, there's seven. Seven things that are one. Number one, one body. Number two, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above. And notice this, there's three here now. This one God who is Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I love these numbers. Amen. So that shows you the Godhead in us. The Lord God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. That shows the Godhead, just like the, the first day of creation does. The first verse of the Bible. But the seven things here, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all. Seven who are all one thing. Uh, and verse uh, seven, but to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So let me just ask you this. Do you think that God gives out more grace to some people than he does others? Obviously, I do. I think some people, just as a matter of nature, they live and would have lived, even if they were not saved, they would have lived a fairly decent, clean life. But that's not everybody. And even the person who, let's say, without Christ, lived a, a somewhat of a moral life, there's still sin there that has to be dealt with. Now, God will give them the grace and the measure of grace that will compensate for the sins and the shortcomings that they have with God. Then there are those who every day need a lot of grace in their life. And does God give it to them? Absolutely he does. So you can look at it like this. Well, you know, God doesn't give as much grace to this person as he does to this person. Is God being unequal? No. No. It's just that God knows who he's dealing with and God knows each and every one of us and God then ministers the amount of grace that each individual needs. And it's not like if this person needs four times as much grace as anybody else in the church, that then is not taking away grace from the people other people in the church who need it. It's not like that God has a limit on grace. It's like, who can remember a day when you went to McDonald's and you ordered a soda and they poured it for you? You only get one. So years ago, I got used to ordering tea because I found out if you go into a restaurant to order tea, they don't mind coming around giving you more all the tea you want. But if you ordered soda, you only get one shot. Well, nowadays, you can get all the soda you want, okay? Sort of a poor analogy, but it's the same way with grace. God doesn't have to take away somebody else's grace to give you his. The Bible says God is rich in mercy. He's got mercy to throw away if he wants. He's rich in it. He's got it in abundance. Amen. 
Uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 4, to Titus, my own son, after the common faith. There it is, common faith. The same faith that Sister Melissa has. It's the same faith, Roy, you walked in here, so you caught my attention, so I'm going to talk about you. Same faith that Roy has. It's a common faith. Melissa doesn't say, well, I only need the New Testament, so I only believe the, old, the New Testament. She didn't say that. She knows that there's two Testaments in her Bible. They're both inspired by God. She understands that in reading both, you, when you read one, you're reading the other. Basically, that's how they work together. They match perfectly. They are mated together. Whereas Roy may say, you know, I get a lot out of the Old Testament. I get a lot out of the Psalms. Well, it doesn't mean he doesn't believe the New Testament. It is a common faith. The way God saves, the way God saves us Americans in 2020 is the same way he saved the Ethiopian eunuch, the same way he saved all the different people that came from different places on the day of Pentecost, the same way he saved those who were in the seven uh, churches in Asia, the churches in Galatia, the church in Corinthians, the, all of the, the same way God saved them and the same gospel is the same gospel that we have now. Jude chapter 1 verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, common salvation, there it is. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And, and there... And this phrase here, he's linking the faith that we have with the same faith that they had on the day of Pentecost. When the, Peter preached the message out of the book of Joel and the men said, Men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized for the remission of sins. And ye shall be saved. And buddy, 3,000 people that day got saved. It's the same faith. It's a common faith. A common way of salvation, a common... Now, there's different churches, and I know there's different beliefs and so on, but when it comes to the gospel, those real churches who are still preaching that same gospel, everybody's saved exactly the same way. No one's different. So, and let's say that there is a church that has a different method of salvation. Well, we believe that if we sprinkle them with our holy water and they eat our holy communion, then they're saved. Should we accept that person into our fellowship? No. No, they are not part of the common salvation. Does anybody know how Joyce Myers supposedly got saved? She actually didn't. But here's her story. Back, and I still have the, I still have the newspaper. In 2004, the Post-Dispatch ran a bunch of articles on Joyce Meyer ministry. And it didn't paint her in a very good picture. So she had to do some PR work after that to try to make herself look good. When I got saved, Brother George, I was nine years old. And I was listening to a missionary talk about his mission work. And he preached a message one night down at a Bible camp I went to. And I remember asking my mom that night, Mom, can I get saved? Yes. Down at the altar, confessing my sins, crying my eyes out. I don't remember all I said, but I remember asking Jesus to live in my heart. Is that how God saved you? You know how God did it with Joyce? She was driving a car and all of a sudden she saw a vision of Jesus. Jesus appeared to her personally and called her into the ministry. And she was into astrology, the occult, divination. She was into all of that. And according to her own account, there was no record of her confessing and repenting of any sins whatsoever. 
It was just a vision that she had where Jesus was calling her to preach the good news that you can be healthy and wealthy and have a lot of money like she has. That's her gospel. Should we accept, should we have her come preach our God, Guns, and Liberty Conference? Our Bible Conference? No. No, I don't think so. Not going to happen. Uh, Romans 1, and then we'll close out. Romans 1, Romans 2, and Romans 10. Then we'll close out. Romans 1, 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first. Because remember, Aaron has... Aaron the high priest wore a breastplate. On that breastplate, he had 12 stones, and on each stone was written the name of a tribe of Israel. And the Bible specifically says this was done so that when Aaron would go into the most holy place, very sacred place. So, and it was so sacred that they tied a rope to his ankles and put bells on the bottom of his robe so that if the bells stopped jingling, that meant Aaron was dead. And they weren't going to send fire and rescue in there. That was the holy place of God. They used the rope to pull his dead body out from the sanctuary of the Lord because they dare not go in there or they too would have been dead okay amen okay uh, where was I going with that that was really good I don't remember what I was saying with that anyway the power of God and salvation oh to the Jew first and also to the Greek Christ is the high priest who goes into the most holy place where God himself is and offers the atonement of salvation to the Jews first. Because remember, they still are God's people. Yeah. Sister, that's what I believe. I believe that, that God is not done with Israel. And I remember there was a preacher that I loved dearly. I loved this man. As, as I was growing up, whenever the pastor of the church here would have him and his family come out and preach to us and sing to us, man, I, I, man, I, I couldn't wait. So I love the family singing and I love to hear him preach. And so uh, after I had been here a couple years, we had a revival and I called him. I said, won't you come preach a revival for us? Sure, I'd love to do it. I, he said, I don't do much revivals anymore, but for you, I'll do it. And I said, okay. So I remember sitting talking with him one time. And he said that he used to believe the like the premillennial viewpoint, the th literal thousand years, and that Israel was God. But he said, I don't know, I just, I don't know, I kind of got away from that. I don't, I don't see it that way anymore. And my heart just sank. And I had enough respect for him and enough, enough admiration for him. He was a, I still, I believe, he's a godly man. Loves the Bible, loves the Lord. But he doesn't see that God's going to save Israel with a mighty salvation in the last days. I can't, I can't have him out preach anymore because of that. And I hate that. But I just can't do it. It's the same salvation, amen, to the Jew first. 
and also to the Greek. Romans 2, 9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Romans 2, 10, but glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Then Romans 10, 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And see, this, this goes then, this is a direct statement to, number one, those who hold, um, I guess, sort of the preterist or amillennial view that God is done with Israel as a nation and that they're really no different than the rest of us and God's going to save them, they, they, then they could get saved, but it's not because they're a Jew. There's that group on the, I would say, maybe the left wing. But then there on the right wing, the hyper dispensationalists would say that, yes, we believe God's going to save Israel, but he's going to save them through law keeping. Which God never said. He never said he was going to save Israel through keeping and holding fast to the law. Never, it didn't happen then and it ain't going to happen now. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And so what if God has to have mercy enough to cover the sins of someone who has committed thousands of sin? Is he still not rich in mercy? Do you think that he's got enough left for you? Absolutely he does. Absolutely he does. All right. Well, we've got some praying to do. Praying for our nation. Amen to that. Praying for... Uh, you know what? It, it, it aggravates me, but if some of these big cities around the country want to eliminate all of their law enforcement that's on them i think it's a stupid idea but roy if they want to do it let them do it who's going to who's going to protect people's neighborhoods at night who's going to try to put Guys who are pushing drugs on little kids. Who's going to protect little children in homes where they're being molested and abused? Who's going to do that? A social worker? A liberal person who actually thinks that the pedophile, that's just their way of life and they can't be blamed for that said no cop ever if you want to meet anybody who actually sees the world with in black and white it is a police officer to them the law is the law and that's how it is some things are right and some things are wrong and that's just how it is and if they want to defund and throw out all their police I, i'm glad to hear those two cops who pushed that 75-year-old agitator, that's what he was. He was an Antifa liberal agitator who was out there. And what we figure out he was doing, he was trying to skim these cop cell phones to steal data from them so that they could either block their cell phone signals or link into their cameras for intel or whatever. That guy was up to absolutely no good because if you watch the video, he was sticking his phone over toward these cops. And the cops said, back off, buddy. And the guy took a dive. No doubt in my mind about it. Well, when they made those two officers step down, the whole rest of the force said, we're done too, see ya. Yeah. Oh, they, a bunch of them quit. And then you've got a sheriff down in Florida said, Come on down here. I got a job for all y'all. Come on down. Got a job for you.